for joining us online today. At Convergence SD, we envision a place where the people of God converge with the purpose of God in establishing the kingdom of God. We'd love to hear how he's doing that in your life. So take a second and shoot us an email at info at convergencesd.com. Let us know how this ministry is impacting your life. If you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so online at convergencesd.com or simply text your gift to 619-344-8454. All right, so uh, we are in a series called Just Show Up, and we've been talking about the different people in the Bible that just showed up and God did a miracle, did incredible things in their lives, and it was just because of their willingness to show up and be present and be open to whatever God would do and, and would want to do. And so we thought, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about different people, and one of the people we're talking about um, is, is Esther. And so, uh, right, Esther? Yes. And so we thought it would be nice to have uh, someone that can relate to Esther, a woman, to come and share about Esther. And so as we were thinking about who would be willing to do that and have the ability to do that and the knowledge and the wisdom to do that and the faith to stand up in front of you and talk, uh, we thought of no one other than our very own uh, Sean McFarlane. And so would you please welcome her as she shares this morning. I just want to pray for you as we enter in. Father, thank you so much for Sean. We pray you bless her today as she shares with us and blesses us. And so uh, guide her thoughts and, and words today and guide our hearts as well in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I got to check a text. You guys are okay with that, right? I mean, Eric did say all I had to do was show up. Right? I mean, you guys are good with that. We go to dinner, we meet with friends, and we sit there on our devices. Is that showing up? No. No. So what does it mean to show up anyway? I mean, we could show up late. We could show up early. And our physical being, being there, doesn't mean that we're really actually even showing up, is it? So I looked it up. I like looking things up. Show up as your full self, and the rest of you will take care of itself. I like that quote. To show up in life as your authentic self with your heart open wide. I thought that was a great definition of what it means to show up. In the Bible, there's several different women who showed up. One of them is Esther. And I don't know, some of you may know her story. I hope most of you do. Um, but there's other women. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how they showed up. And then we're going to go to Esther. So um, the woman at the well, she showed up. She showed up to the well and had no idea what was going to go on. But then she showed up in a different way because once she had an encounter with God and he said, and she went back to the people and she said, I met a man who knew everything about me, told me everything about me. She showed up with her whole heart to the people. And God showed up in an amazing way with her. Church history says that she became a major evangelist. She used to be called apostle before church history decided that women were no longer apostles, but that's a different subject. <laughs> um, she was responsible for bringing a large part of Nero's household to Christ. I think that's pretty significant. So the woman with the issue of blood showed up and just touched the robe of Jesus and was healed. Ruth, Ruth, she, sh she showed up. She showed up for Naomi, and then she did what Naomi said, and she showed up for Boaz. Now, Esther. So Esther was a queen, and she became queen because the former queen didn't show up. That's, I think, pretty significant. And so Esther shows up, and uh, let's go to Esther a little bit. So I think it's interesting the way Esther shows up. She shows up as a child, pretty much. She's young. Uh, she gets picked to be a virgin in the king's harem. He's looking for a new wife. And so she ends up there, and he chooses her. Why? Because she was wise, and she listened to the king's eunuchs and, and basically followed the directions. And so Esther shows up to the king with exactly what she was told to bring, and the king chooses her. 
Now, if you know the story, um, Haman, bad man, really bad man, he wants to kill all the jewels, Jews, which are the jewels, too. I like that. Uh, sometimes you say things by accident, and they really prove to be very true. So anyway, so Haman wants to kill the Jews because of one, Mordecai, who wouldn't bow down to him, which we're not supposed to bow down to anybody but God, are we? Yeah. So anyway, so Esther is asked by her uncle and says, basically, there's an edict out, and all the Jews are to be killed and this was a manipulation by Haman. And so Esther's uncle, Mordecai, comes and says, Esther, you need to go before the king. You need to plead the case. You need to let him what's, know what's going on. So I'm going to kind of go to Esther. And so if you have your Bibles or you have a Bible app or anything like that, we're going to go to Esther chapter 4, verse 11. No. So this is Esther. Let me set it up here. This is Esther telling Mordecai why she can't do what he just said. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that for any man or woman who comes to the king to the inner court without being summoned, he has but one law, that he is to be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he or she may live. And as for me, I have not been summoned to the king for these last 30 days. So I think it's interesting back then, to show up in the king's courts, you had to be summoned. And I think that's a little bit like the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't have access to the inner courts. We had access to the outer courts. And so Esther's saying, hey, look, you know, I, I want to help you, but I don't know. If I can, I, I could, it's a death sentence. But Esther had something that the rest of the people in the courts didn't, especially the concubines. She had relationship with the king. So she decides, I'm going to do it. Okay, you're right. Because her uncle basically says, don't think that you're going to escape. And I think that's not what motivated her. And he says later on, he says, who knows but that you have been born at this time, at this place, for this reason, to save the Jewish people. And he says, if you don't show up, God will surely bring someone who will. But so Esther does it. She goes in, and she... Thank you for your phone. And the king sees her. And because they have relationship, he extends the scepter, and he says... You know, what do you want, Queen Esther? Up to half my kingdom. And I thought, wow, that's really cool, half the kingdom. And then I learned that that was just a saying. Like, you know what, you can have anything you want. Like, it's just a saying. You can't really have anything and everything you want. Just so you know. Not giving away half the kingdom. So Esther goes in. She is granted an audience. And she, and I don't know if you know the rest of the story, she is able to persuade not really persuade even, she, she develops more intimacy, more relationships. She says, I want to have dinner with you. And he's like, okay, great. So she has dinner, they have this, she's basically rebuilding that intimacy. She hasn't seen him for 30 days. So she's reconnecting with him. Then she says, I want to have dinner with you again. And that's when she brings up the edict that Haman had declared over the Jews. And he was outraged. And what does he do? He kills Haman. Now, moving into what God really wants for us. So we have an earthly king, and then we also have a heavenly king. When I was reading about what really showing up might look like, um, I was wondering why we don't show up. So, so there's different kinds of showing up, right, in different types of relationships. We can show up in our personal relationships. And then I wondered, like, how often are we? Like, how often do we meet and not show up if we're on our devices or with our kids? Are we so busy that we don't really sit down and listen? Do we show up for them? In a marriage, I, I would imagine that that would be very difficult to continually show up, show up, show up. And that there are times in which you want to hide or you just want to shut down because it feels more convenient. But does it do the relationship any good? No. And so the same thing with God. 
if we want a relationship with God, we've got to show up. And that means with our heart open wide. It doesn't mean doing devotions every morning at 5 a.m. because somebody told you that 5 a.m. meant you were a good Christian. And 6.30, you were not a good Christian. 5 a.m., you were a good Christian. 6.30, you were a little lazy, but okay. And if you got up at 7 and then went to work and then did your devotions in the evening because that's the way you like to do them, well, you're a backslider and we can work with you. But doing devotions isn't showing up, is it? I mean, I can be at dinner and on my phone and that's not showing up. I can be somewhere physically. I can be going through the motions and that's not showing up. So why don't we show up with God? Because I think when we show up with God, then we can show up with other people. We can show up with our, even ourselves, because I think there's a lot of times that we hide from ourselves, right? We don't want to deal with the stuff that's going on. So a couple of the things that I found in, um, I, I love this, what we now have access to, according to the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians 3.12, if you guys want to go there real quickly. If you don't, I'll read it. In the Amplified Version, it says, um, basically, the preface is referring to Christ, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. That is, our faith gives us sufficient courage to freely and openly approach God through Christ. So Christ is our access. Christ is really the golden scepter that has been extended to all of us to freely have access to the throne room anytime we want. I love the Passion Translation. It says, now we have boldness through him and free access as kings and queens before the Father. It doesn't really say queens. I added that just so you know. <laughs> but I know what he meant. Because of our complete confidence in Christ's faithfulness. And then the message goes, says this. When we trust in him, we are free to say whatever needs to be said. I don't know about you, but I don't know if God appreciates me always saying what I think needs to be said. But I can tell you this. I show up to God as my authentic self. And it's not always pretty, but it's honest. And because of that, you know, I have an amazing relationship with him. I'm not trying to hide my flaws. I'm not trying to be perfect before him because I already am. I know some people think that's blasphemous. I was thinking about the verse um, that he separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Do you know why he didn't say as far as the north is from the south? He used east from the west. North and south meet at some point. You have a north pole and you have a south pole. The east and the west have no meeting place. You continue to go and go and go. There's no meeting place. They never come back together. And I think that's pretty amazing considering at that time when this was written, they had no idea about that. Like that had to be God. Like, hello, I just proved that there was a God right there. In case you were wondering. In Romans, it says, We who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit also inwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. For this is the hope of our salvation. But hope means we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. The things that grab me in that, and that's from the Passion Translation as well. If you have never heard of the Passion Translation, if you don't have the Passion Translation, I highly suggest that you get the Passion Translation. I was raised in the church. This is not a commercial for it. I've read a lot of different versions and translations. I love the Bible, but it has brought the scriptures alive in a meaningful, passionate way. So, um, Back to this scripture. The things that stood out to me were to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters. 
And it says that this is the hope of our salvation. The hope of our salvation is to experience the full status as sons and daughters. I know you are all wondering today, what is the hope of our salvation? That's it. Free access into the throne room as sons and daughters. I think that's pretty amazing. Are we experiencing it, though? Or are we still waiting in the outer court, waiting to be called in for fear that if we go in, we're going to drop dead? I don't know if you know this, but in Old Testament, they used to tie a rope around the ankle of a priest as he went into the inner courts in case he dropped dead because he wasn't completely clean before the Lord. And now we have free access because we are completely clean because of his blood, not what we've done. So we can stop trying to do and rest in the fact that we are his sons and daughters, and we have free access, and he wants relationship. One of my favorite speakers is um, Dan Moeller, and I love what he talks about. He, he says, and it's true, because this is the way I grew up, that the American church, and I only know the American church, um, we often talk about, and this is how I was told, that Jesus died because we are sinners. Has anybody ever heard that? Yeah? Jesus didn't die because we are sinners. He died because we are sons and daughters. Now, he had to die because of our sin, but that's not why he died. He died because we are valuable. We're sons and daughters. He died because the relationship was broken. He died because he wanted us to be able to show up fully, completely, without trying to hide and cover up, without sacrificing animals, without doing all these things to be able to show up. He wanted us to just be able to show up and be in relationship. You go back, you read about Adam and Eve. They walked with God. They had relationship. They were able to show up. And what happened? The, really, the crux of it, they ate the fruit, and they were no longer able to show up. They hid. So showing up. It's a beautiful gift that we have access and privilege to show up. I don't know. To me, that's exciting. That's amazing. That is not how I grew up believing. I grew up believing that someday if I worked really, 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 really hard, I could show up, that I could have a relationship. And I honestly didn't even know he wanted a relationship. I thought he just wanted obedience. I was at a women's conference, and uh, this young lady, she was not a Christian when she came. She came, she accepted the Lord, she got all this input, and I remember late one night where, because um, it was a dormitory style, and we had a shared bathroom, and she said to me, she's like, so, you know, I'm, I said, how exciting that you just be accepted the Lord, like, that's amazing, and uh, she's like, yeah, she said, I'm just really worried. And I said, about what? She goes, that, I'm, that I don't have it right, like what to do. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, let me just make sure I have this right. So the most important thing is obedience, right? I'm like, oh my God, no. Now that comes through relationship. So when you know God, you trust God. And when you trust God, you're obedient. And when you're obedient, it builds faith. And you're able to trust God more. And then you're more obedient because you trust God. And it's the cycle, and it increases your intimacy. But if you start off trying to just be obedient outside of relationship, that's not going to work. I said, you need to know who he is. You need to know that he loves you. Your primary goal right now today is to know how much he loves you so that you can in turn love yourself, so that you can trust him, and then you can be obedient. But if you try to do start with obedience, you'll probably fail, and you'll probably feel bad about yourself, and then you're going to wander away from Christianity because it just makes you feel bad about yourself. And that wasn't God's intention at all. So, how many of you 
have read um, Song of Songs. I love Song of Songs. I will tell you this, I now love Song of Songs. I did not always like Song of Songs. And the reason is because I didn't understand it. I'm like deer and antelope and valleys and hills and I don't know how that really even relates to me. Um, but in this new translation that I have, I love it. So I'm going to read you a little bit in Song of Songs. And you are not probably going to be able to follow me unless if you're, well, actually, if you have the Bible app, you can go to the Passion Translation. They have it there. And I'm going to be start off with chapter 1, verse 8. This is the shepherd king. This is him talking to his bride. So you do know that he refers to the church as his bride. Uh, in Revelations, in Isaiah, and repeatedly in the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. Same book. Um, so this is the king talking to us, because we, the church, is the bride of Christ. He says, listen, my radiant one, if you ever lose sight of me, just follow in my footsteps where I lead my lovers. Come with your burdens and cares. Come to the place near the sanctuary of my shepherds. I mean, to me, that sounds like he wants some intimacy, right? Like it's a relationship. It's a real relationship. And I like that he tells us how to find him. If you ever lose sight of me, because sometimes we do, sometimes we lose sight of him. Just this week, I was um, traveling. Uh, I left Sunday. I wasn't here last Sunday because I just, I was going, going, going. I was traveling Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, got back Friday. I had a friend in town. I was asked to dog sit and I'm like, I have to prepare. And I really didn't feel like I really was present with God. I, I wanted to be. I, I knew that I should be, and it was my intention to be. But life gets really super busy. And I love this verse. As I'm flying home on the airplane, I have a couple hours. I'm like, okay, here, here we go, God. But I like it because we don't have. it doesn't have to be in a corner. It doesn't have to be over a certain... Um, devotional. It doesn't have to be doing a certain thing. Time with God can look differently for everybody. It can be a walk. It can be a nap. It can be sitting in a specific chair. It can be playing music. It can be playing tennis. It can be whatever it is that you do with God. That's all he wants. Just show up in that way. But I like it that he says, if you ever lose sight of me, just follow in my footsteps where I lead my lovers. I'm his lover. That's awesome. Now we're going to go to uh, chapter 2 and 10 through 16. And this is, again, God talking to us says, Arise, my dearest, hurry, my darling, come away with me. I have come, as you have asked, to draw you to my heart and lead you out. For now is the time, my beautiful one, the season has changed. The bondage of your, burden, your barren winter has ended, and the season of hiding is over and gone. I'm actually going to skip ahead a little bit. Down to... Verse 15. I thought this was interesting after this whole invitation to be personal. Um, and he says, You must catch the troubling foxes, those sly little foxes that hinder our relationship, for they raid our budding vineyard of love to ruin what I've planted within you. And so I read a little commentary on that. And um, the budding, uh, the foxes are the things in life they get in the way. They're just distractions. They're the things we haven't brought to God. They're the things we're trying to hide from him because we're either not ready to deal with it or we're still ashamed of it. 
But through all this intimacy, he's saying, look, I want to have this amazing, incredible, intimate, loving relationship with you. And again, go on Bible app, get this version, read it. It's the first time that I ever wept when I read this translation. It was personal, it was intimate. Those are the things that God's saying, you know what, show up. Show up. Show up. I'm going to close because I was told I only have a limited amount of time and I could talk about God forever and all day and really should have given me about two hours. That would have been sufficient. But, um, and then I would have gone over that. Um, but I'm going to read a, a closing prayer over you. Um, but before I do, I do want to challenge you. Because I don't want to just leave and say, hey, here's, here's a word, you know. I, I want to challenge you to examine in your life where you're not showing up. Are you not showing up to yourselves? Are you hiding from yourselves? Are you not showing up in your personal relationships with your kids, your spouse, your parents? Are you not showing up in your relationship with God? And then why? And if you just ask God to help you with that, he's super faithful about doing that, to say, hey, God, give me permission. Show me where I'm not showing up. But you also have to make a conscious decision to want to show up, even if you don't know how. So... Ephesians 3. So again, this is Passion Translation. Um, This is Paul's prayer for the church. So he says, So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father, and child in heaven and on earth. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you. And the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love how enduring and inclusive it is, endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request your most unbelievable dream and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? That's really not only Paul's heart for you, but that's God's heart for you. So I encourage you. It all just starts with, hey, God, I haven't really been showing up. I want to. Show me. Let's do it. It changes a lot. It changes everything. Relationship changes everything. Relationship grants you access. But you can't have relationship or access without showing up. And access gets you a lot of really cool things. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you for this beautiful beautiful bride that you have that she is pure and white 
and God, that you have given us full access to you. I thank you that people, um, yeah, that you love us so much, that you call us friend, that you call us lover, and that you no longer call us servants, that you call us your children. So thank you, Father. Just bless everyone as we go out this day. joining us online today. At Convergence SD, we envision a place where the people of God converge with the purpose of God in establishing the kingdom of God. We'd love to hear how he's doing that in your life. So take a second and shoot us an email at info at convergencesd.com. Let us know how this ministry is impacting your life. If you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so online at convergencesd.com. Or simply text your gift to 619-344-8454.